Welcome back everyone, Alex Javaris here. In this video, I'm going to be talking about oil paint, which brands and what colors you should use. When you walk into any art supply store, you will find literally hundreds of different colors and many different brands of oil paint. If you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it can be pretty overwhelming and it's really hard to know where to begin. So in this video, I'm going to be explaining about all these different kinds of oil paint and showing you which brands and which colours I think you should use. The first thing you need to know about oil paint is that it comes in three different grades. Student grade, mid-range artist grade and top quality professional grade. What determines the quality of these different grades is the amount of pigment they each contain. The pigments we use to make oil paint come from a wide range of sources, animal, vegetable, mineral and synthetic. Some pigments, like earth colours, which are literally made of mud, are really cheap, while others, rare metals like cadmium and cobalt, are very expensive. Student grade paint will contain the least amount of pigment often as little as 10%. The rest of the paint will be made up of oil and other fillers. Most oil colours are made with linseed oil, but sometimes other oils are used, like safflower oil or walnut oil. Because student grade paints contain so little actual pigment, their tinting strength is much less than better quality brands, and they're also much more oily. Of all the different kinds of student grade paint I've used, probably the best is the Winton range by Windsor & Newton. The other thing with student grade paints is that with more expensive colours like cadmium yellows and reds, they won't contain any pigment at all, but instead they will use dyes. This can be seen on their tubes, where instead of cadmium red it will say cadmium red hue. And because they substitute the more expensive pigments with dyes, student grade colours will all have the same price. But with better quality brands, because they contain real pigment, some colours will be much more expensive than others. A 40mm tube of a Series 1 colour made with cheaper pigments from a professional quality brand like Michael Harding will cost around six or seven pounds. Whereas a 40mm tube of a Series 5 colour made with a more expensive pigment like cadmium red will cost around £30. Mid-range paints will be a little less expensive. That's because even though mid-range paints still use real pigment, they contain a greater amount of oil and other fillers than professional quality brands. Mid-range brands include things like Windsor & Newton, Gamlin, Sennelier or Rembrandt. They are all perfectly reliable and professional artists use mid-range brands all the time. I recently discovered a very reasonably priced Russian brand called Masterclass by a company called Nevskaya Pelitra. I hope I pronounced that correctly. This is apparently the paint they use at the Repin Academy in St. Petersburg. I'll put a link in the description below if you want to know more about them. Here are some of the professional quality brands, Michael Harding, Old Holland and Williamsburg. But there are many others, Vasari, Rublev and lots of smaller brands specialising in handmade paint. I'm not going to recommend a particular brand of professional grade paint because I believe they're all of comparable quality. However, while they all make versions of the widely used pigments, there will be some colours that are unique to particular brands. Also, the appearance of the same colour can vary between different brands. So there might be a colour that you like that only one brand makes or you might prefer one brand's version of a certain colour, like yellow ochre, to another's, so that you end up using different brands for different colours. Now, with all these different brands and colours to choose from, which should you use? Well, 
While you're still learning, you might think it's better to save money and stick to student grade paint. And it's definitely true that you don't need expensive colours in order to learn to paint. I used student grade paint for many years before switching to better quality brands. But once you switch, there really is no turning back. Mid-range and professional quality paint is certainly a lot nicer to use. And because they use more pigment, they make it easier to mix colours. Also, while I know of many highly accomplished professional artists who use cheap brushes or who paint on cheap surfaces, I don't know any who use cheap paint. So it's my opinion that if you can afford better quality paint, you should use it. And while it may be more expensive, perhaps it isn't quite as expensive as you think. If you take large 225 milliliter tubes of a series one color by a better quality brand like Michael Harding, they usually cost around 25 pounds, while a 200 milliliter tube of Winton costs 12 pound 50. So with cheaper pigments, better quality brands only cost around twice as much, and it's just the higher series colors that cost a lot more. So if we can find cheaper alternatives, for the more expensive colours, then perhaps there's a palette of better quality colours we could use that won't break the bank. To test this theory, I'm going to be painting a landscape using a limited palette of lower series colours. And I'm going to substitute some of the more expensive colours I normally use for cheaper alternatives. The palette I'm using is essentially made of different versions of the three primaries and titanium white. I'm using ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson and naples yellow. Instead of cadmium red, I'm going to be using Windsor red by Windsor and Newton, which is a series two color and costs £9.10 for a 37 milliliter tube. And instead of cadmium yellow, I'm going to be trying two different yellows. Windsor Yellow by Windsor and Newton and Yellow Lake by Michael Harding, which is a series one color and costs £6.90 for a 40 milliliter tube. And the scene I'm going to be painting is this fairly simple composition of some silver birch trees on a winter morning. The first thing I'm going to do is tone my panel by putting down a coloured ground. For the colour of my ground, I'm trying to match the warm purple brown colour of the trees made as the sky passes through all the small leafless branches. I'm making this colour by mixing alizarin crimson with ultramarine, then greying it down by adding Naples yellow. When I'm landscape painting, I normally use a slightly more extended palette, including earth colours and greens. But for this demo, I thought I'd show you how versatile a limited palette of the three primaries can actually be, and how you can use one to paint something as colourful as a landscape. Here, I'm wiping back my ground with some paper towel to make sure it's dry enough before I start painting on it. I'm working on one of the oil primed linen panels I showed you how to make in my previous video on supports. And you can see how once it's wiped back, it gives me quite an interesting texture. Next, I'm going to start mapping out the subject with a few simple lines. Indicating the main masses, the sky, the trees and foliage in the middle ground and the foreground. I'm now mixing a colour for the sky, made with ultramarine and titanium white, but I'm also adding a little Naples yellow and alizarin crimson to grey it down slightly. If you paint the sky with just blue and white, it will appear bluer and more saturated than it really is. The colours we see in nature are often much more muted and neutral than we think. Even the blue sky, which towards the top of the painting contains a little more red. But as it moves lower towards the horizon, 
The sky colour gets lighter and cooler, containing more yellow. Here I'm adding some of the yellow lake, but as you can see this particular yellow is too strong and has turned the sky into a bright green. So instead I'm going to use the warmer, more neutral Naples yellow. This is the reason I'm using more neutral versions of the three primaries for this palette. If I were to only use stronger versions of the three primaries, like say cobalt blue and Windsor red and Windsor yellow, it would make it much harder to match the more neutral colours we see in nature. But the warmer darker ultramarine, the cooler darker alizarin and the warmer Naples yellow make it a lot easier. I'd even be able to match more neutral flesh colours, so I could also use this palette for portrait and figure painting. Right, here I'm starting to mix a light grey colour for the clouds. I want you to notice how I'm using a palette knife. This is to make sure I use enough paint. By far the biggest mistake I see beginners make when it comes to paint is not to use enough of it. So if there's one thing I want you to remember after watching this video is to make sure you use enough paint. Earlier on I recommended using better quality paint if you could afford it. But I would much prefer that you use student grade paint and use plenty of it and be stingy with better quality paints. In general, we have had it ingrained in us by our parents not to be wasteful, to finish all the food on our plates, and quite rightly so. But when it comes to oil painting, particularly direct a la prima oil painting, we need to adopt the opposite attitude. Extravagance is key. To achieve clean, lifelike colours, and also to be able to achieve solid painterly brushwork, you need to use plenty of paint. One of the most obvious differences between work by experienced artists and that of amateur painters is the amount of paint used. So this is by far the most important thing I've got to say on the subject of oil paint. Make sure you use enough of it whichever brands or colours you decide to use. Here I'm scraping back the sky with my palette knife. It's not really visible from the reference image, but the sky today is full of light hazy clouds. So I've decided to wipe back the sky with some paper towel dipped in solvent as this will give me a light grey violet wash which I reckon will work quite well for creating the effect of the hazy clouds. Here I'm wiping right back to the white of the linen panel to show how the clouds get lighter just above the horizon. Next I'm just drying off my wash by dabbing it gently with some paper towel so that it isn't too wet before I start painting into it. I'm now ready to paint the blue sky showing through the clouds, starting with the cooler lighter sky colour nearer to the horizon. And here I'm mixing more of the warmer darker sky colour containing more alizarin crimson. which I'm going to use for the sky as it moves towards the top of the painting. Once again I'm mixing more of my lighter cooler blue containing more yellow for the sky as it moves nearer to the horizon. And I think that's enough work on the sky for now, so next I'm going to start work on the trees. Here I'm using my palette knife to mix a colour for all the small branches and foliage towards the top of the tree. I see this colour as a warm grey violet made with white alizarin and blue 
but also containing a certain amount of Naples yellow to grey it down. And do you see how much lighter my tree colour is when working from life compared to the trees in the reference photo? To apply this colour, I'm going to use my palette knife. Notice how this creates the texture of the foliage, particularly around the edges of the trees where the sky can be seen through all the small branches. I'm now mixing a darker green colour for all the foliage towards the bottom of the trees. I see this as being quite a neutral olive green colour, so I'm mainly using Naples yellow and blue but I'm also adding a little alizarin crimson. In the reference image, because the trees are so dark, you can hardly tell the difference between this green at the bottom of the trees and the other foliage. This is a great example of why you should always try to do colour studies from life before working from photos. I'm now taking some of my sky colour and mixing it together with the foliage. I'm using this mixture for the areas where the sky is visible through the trees. Notice how I'm ignoring all the details like individual branches and sky holes and I'm simplifying them into larger areas of mid-tone with a value that's in between the sky and the trees. Next, I'm using my brush to place some of the larger, more prominent sky holes. The important thing to remember about sky holes appearing through trees is that they will almost always be darker than the sky. Here, I'm mixing a warmer, lighter brown colour for the foliage on the ground right in front of the trees. And here I'm mixing a darker brown, which I'm going to use for the shadows in the foliage and also for some of the darks in the foreground. With the larger masses in the trees blocked in, I'm now ready to start work on the grass in the foreground. Here I'm mixing a light green for the light area at the top of the foreground. This is the brightest colour in this whole painting. And if I was to try and mix this bright green with Naples yellow and blue, I wouldn't be able to get it bright enough. This is why I need to use one of the other brighter yellows. The light area of the grass is caused by a ray of warm sunlight, so I'm using some of the warm yellow lake. But I don't think it's quite light enough, so here I'm mixing a lighter version using the Windsor yellow. Both the yellow lake and the Windsor yellow are made of the same modern synthetic pigment, Hansa yellow, or to give it its colour index number, PY74. Both yellows work quite well and have good tinting strength. Tinting strength is one of the properties that will vary between different pigments. Other properties include light fastness, how resistant they are to fading, drying time, opacity and toxicity. If you're interested in finding out more about the properties of different pigments, one of the best resources is the Artist's Handbook of Materials and Techniques by Ralph Mayer. But you can also find a lot of information on the manufacturer's websites. The Michael Harding website is particularly good. Right here, I'm mixing a colour for the darker part of the foreground, which is being created by the shadow of some trees just behind me. Because this area isn't in direct sunlight, it gets cooler and darker than the light area. So I'm mixing a green which contains much more blue and also a little white. Now, you'll have heard me talking about warmer and cooler colours quite a bit during this demo. But because this video is about paint rather than colour, 
I haven't been able to talk about how to actually see and mix colour in greater depth. There are other videos on mixing colour elsewhere on this channel and I'll put links in the description. But if you're interested in learning more about the subject of colour itself, part one of my Essentials of Colour course is now available to watch over on my Patreon channel. This includes a series of straightforward exercises filmed in real time that have been designed to give you a thorough understanding of some of the key principles that will help you see and mix colours accurately, starting with colour temperature. There's also a few more suggestions for limited palettes on there, so feel free to check it out. Right, so here I'm adding some green to the foliage along the bottom of the tree line. Next, I'm mixing a dark purple colour, which I'm going to use for some of the dark accents in the bushes and amongst the trees. I'm also using it to paint some of the darks in the foreground where the earth is showing through the grass. This is to lead the eye into the painting, and looking at these now, I could have definitely made them a bit more interesting. This can often be the way with plein air painting. Because you have to work so quickly, there will sometimes be things that you miss and could have done better. But you can always come back to paintings and rework them later on in the studio. Here I'm mixing a different version of my light green using more Naples yellow. This is to add a bit more colour variety to the lights in the foreground. I'm now ready to start adding some of the details, like the branches in the trees. Here I'm scratching out some of the most prominent branches with the back of my brush. These details will focus the viewer's attention, bringing together the larger masses and making the image appear more lifelike. But if you add too many details, they will distract the viewer and you won't achieve the same effect. So I don't want to paint every single branch I can see. Here I'm just cleaning off my palette before mixing more of my warm foliage colour so I can add more of the foliage in the trees. And here I'm mixing a cool light grey colour which I'm going to use for the lights on the trunks and the branches of the silver birch trees. Here, once again, I'm using the back of my brush to scratch out the smaller branches. And hopefully, that's just enough detail to create the main centre of interest. Next, I'm adding a few more smaller dark accents to the bushes in the foreground and in between some of the tree trunks just behind the main birch trees. Finally, I'm placing a couple of small sky holes in the trees to define some of the smaller branches. And with those last few details, I think I'm going to leave it there. The first landscape painting demo I've done for this channel. I hope you enjoyed it and that it's shown you how you can paint something as colourful as a landscape with just a few colours. And also, I hope it's given you some cheaper alternatives to much more expensive cadmium reds and yellows. So until next time, good luck with your painting and remember to check out my Patreon channel if you want to know more about my Essentials of Colour course. Thank you for watching.